one. Hello, everyone. In this video, God, uh, I've interviewed a lot of filmmakers. This one is truly a very special one to me. Uh, in this video, I'm fortunate enough to sit down. Genuinely one of my heroes, and in my opinion, one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. The amazing, the Academy Award nominated, Martin Brest. I don't even know where to begin. Martin is the director behind films <laughs> such as Scent of a Woman, Midnight Run, Going in Style, Meet Joe Back, Beverly Hills Cop. And the fact that he takes the time to chat with some little nuisance like me means the world. Martin, how are you doing today, sir? Very good. It's an honor to get a chance to interview Daniel Fee. You think you're interviewing me, but... That's not what's going on there. I'm interviewing you today. Oh, God, Mar Martin, I don't even know where to begin. So I I've had this channel for a while. And when I first started, everyone, I must have sent out 100 messages like every day to filmmakers I admired. And no one would reply. And I could understand that because I was just messaging them saying, I love your film and, and stuff like that. And like, like, I couldn't get any replies. And I remember, I like, I vividly remember one day I was like, look, if like, I'll give it a few days. If I get nothing, it's look, it's not for me. This is something real journalists should do. And then one day I get an email and it's from Martin Brest. And I swear to God, I almost fall, I almost fell off my chair. And it is the kindest email I've ever received. And it just, it really inspired me to keep going. And since then, I've gotten to interview so many amazing filmmakers, so much so with the recent Joe Russo team. Afterwards, I just said to myself, you know, I need to message Martin Brest because he just inspired me to keep going. And, you know, like, look, I'm under no disillusions that I'm worthy of anyone's time. But... You know, the fact that a filmmaker like Martin Brest, like just for someone like me to hear that, it's crazy. And, and it's encouraged me more than words can articulate. So that's that's me blowing smoke early in the interview. So Martin, sir, thank you so much, sir. What a pleasure to chat with you. And I mean, this is one of your, I mean, you recently kind of broke your vow of silence. You did an interview with Variety. <laughs> so is this your first video interview in a while? Uh, yeah, I would say in 20 plus years. 20 plus years. Oh my God. I, and the fact that it's with it Daniel Fee to, to get me on video. Oh my God. So first of all, I feel, I, I know you're doing this now, this uh, journalistic approach, but do you feel like you want to be a filmmaker? Oh my God. That's the dream. Yeah. Yeah. yeah filmmaker. You're going to be one. You're going to be one. You are going to be one. God, ah, oh, yeah. Wow, thank you, sir. Like my 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 dad Simon is deaf, and growing up, it was, like Midnight Run was one of the first films he showed me, and you know, and I, it was watching a film like that, and I think I never, you know, when you replied to that email, I I remember thinking the person who created one of my favorite films within his lifetime acknowledged me on some level, and I like I remember thinking that, but your work has like touched my heart in ways I can't even articulate. And your films have just meant so much to me. And I think, you know, because I obviously both my parents are deaf. So film is something that's always been this this amazing visual platform, you know, whether it's a it's a French film or you know, I have bicycle thieves up there, whether it's a Italian film or or a German film, you know, subtitles are just, you know, it's like you know, it's a two-inch barrier, you know, to overcome. And so films have meant so much to me. And that's where your work comes in. You know, my, like my dad, when I told him I was interviewing you, he said, oh, brilliant films. Because he always does that. That's sign language for brilliant. So when he thinks something's good, he goes, brilliant films. And so, you know, your work has touched my heart more than words can articulate. Thank, uh, you. Thank oh, you. Oh, God, it's my pleasure. I mean, first things first, I'd just love to ask you, sir, where does your love for film come from? Were you a boy watching silent French films or, or where does this admiration of film come from? Uh, well, it probably started before I was conscious that it was happening. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in, in New York City, in the Bronx, actually, wow. there was a thing called Million Dollar Movie. It was really interesting. I think it's responsible for a whole school of cinema. What it was was this sort of non-network channel, not one of the big channels, but a yeah. sort of a dopey little channel on television when television only had six or seven channels. Um, and what they would do is they'd get old Hollywood movies. I guess they bought them really cheaply. Yeah. And they'd show them, they'd show the same movie every day of the week, twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday. So you could watch the same movie over and over again, which was a revelation because prior to home video, you'd see a movie and that was it. You'd have to hold it in your head. You couldn't go back and look at the same scene again unless you know, unless you went to the theater twice. Yeah. Uh, 
but or you know unless you went to go see a great movie in a revival house that would show classic old movies but to see the same movie to be able to see the same movie four or five times in one week was a revelation because you could start to see even though even if you were unconsciously looking at it if you felt the experience you were able to then somehow subliminally see how that experience was constructed to make the impact on you. Yeah. Uh, and there was also a television show, uh, of an early television show that was done in the early 1950s that was so popular it kept running and reruns. I think it's still on somewhere. Uh, it was called The Honeymooners. It was about this. Uh, do you know this? Uh, yeah, know yeah, this yeah. Show? Yeah, it's like a very working class. And um, uh, it was a, a bus driver and his wife whose friend upstairs worked in the sewer. And so that guy and his wife, and there's these guys and they get into stupid predicaments. It was very low production value, no, you know, like a dopey little set of this poor little apartment. And it was just these two actors going at it, basically, these two. And they were spectacular. And that made an impression on me, although I didn't understand it at the time. And then, my brother-in-law took me to see, when I was around, I guess, 12 or 13, uh, they had a revival of Charlie Chaplin movies in Manhattan. And that was a revelation. That I didn't understand what I was seeing, but the impact on me was so profound. They moved me so. Yeah. They were funny and uh, uh, eternal and very moving. The ones I saw were very moving. And that kind of thunderstruck me, although I didn't put it together per se. It took me years via an interest in still photography to then sort of come around and realize that I was interested in the process of putting sound and picture together over time. Yeah. And then in film school, I realized, that, I realized that in order to do that, you had to write something so that you could film it. So I wrote something so I could film it. And then I realized that I liked that writing and I guess it was called directing. So it came sort of backwards in a way. Yeah. Oh, and I mean, you talked there about Chaplin and his film. I mean, I've been watching Buster Keaton's work recently and Chaplin's work. Mm. And I think that though, that's kind of, that's visual storytelling at its best, you know, because um, I was recently at a film festival with my dad and my dad's, of course, deaf. And I remember thinking, if my dad can watch these films and if he can come away and understand what this film meant, despite the fact there were no subtitles, that means mm -hmm. it's a good film because it was visual storytelling. They managed to tell the story visually and with pictures. So mm -hmm. it's fascinating. You know, you talk about Chaplin because I was watching The General by Buster Keaton and that's a mm -hmm. film completely visual. You can be deaf and watch that. Yeah. So it, it's really fascinating. And so is that where your love for visual storytelling came from was it watching you know no i never Chaplin? thought of you know it's funny i remember when i was in film school or even after film school and i heard somebody say the obvious the film is a visual medium yeah and when they said it i thought wait a minute is it a visual medium wow i suppose it's a visual medium but would you say literature is a visual medium because you have to look at it it never occurred to me that film was a visual me media. I never thought in those terms. And that's probably why from a visual aspect, my films are sort of rudimentary. You know, they're a little on the simplistic end. They're not flashy. They don't have visual style. My focus was the uh, architecture of one's emotional involvement. Yeah. That's really what I was into. Like. How do you feel when you sit down? How do you feel 30 seconds later? What do you think of this character? What do you think of the way he thinks of this other character? You know, that sort of sculpting of your involvement is really what my focus was. Uh, and and the visual stuff, I mean, I love it, but it wasn't something that I was, uh, I showed any panache for or, or interest in exploring, even though I would, could appreciate it and yeah. enjoy it. And I love painting. Uh, and you know, I'm an art fanatic, uh, but I uh, I never thought of yeah, and I love silent films, silent comedies particularly. Wow. But uh, again, from a different approach. So you could say, well, what's your emotional involvement when you see a long shot of a character versus yeah. a medium close up? So there's a different, you have a different uh, degree of emotional engagement with that character. So that was my focus. 
And it can translate to, as I said, a rudimentary visual uh, technique. Yeah, and, and it's so fascinating there. I think you talk about character. And I think if you look at your films, that's what's inherent in it. It's these people you end up caring about, you know, and even if they're not likable, even in Scent of a Woman when there's this character mm-hmm. and, and, you know, and he's gruff and you kind of look at him and yet there's something that draws you to him. And by the end of the film, you care about him in Midnight Run. You know, you probably shouldn't care about John, but, you know, you do, you kind of hope he gets away at some point. Mm-hmm. Is is character what draws you into your stories? Is it the idea of people? Totally. Really? Totally. I almost feel like uh, I'm acting vicariously. Wow. In other words, I'm putting, uh, I mean, this is how I think of it. I, 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 would, I, would, I don't say this to people, but I, I think of myself as the, this kind of like the soul of the story. And then I'm going to do this with my soul and that with my soul and this with my soul yeah. and kind of uh, uh, convey that in a way. And uh, and what also one of the things I would do, and again, I never say this out loud, but uh, before I uh, would do something, before, you know, even the films I don't have the screenplay credit on, I work very, 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 very closely on the structure, overall structure, on the scene structure, on the dialogue, on this, everything. I, I work yeah. very closely on all of that. That's really what where I feel I make my contribution. But one of the things I would do is I would try and work my way into an emotional state, like a feeling. And then once I felt that feeling, I try and figure out how to reverse engineer it so that I can make other people feel it. Sort of like a weird cyst. It's not a cyst, it's a really weird cockamamie way of going about it. But when you talked about Son of a Woman, one of the things that attracted to me, attracted me to it originally, because it's based on an Italian movie uh, starring Vittorio Gosman from the early to mid seventies. One of the things that attracted me to it was the possibility of having a character that's loathsome. Yeah. And yet you look at him and you somehow, even though he's giving you not one reason to like him, somehow there's something that makes you not want to like him, but you're a little conflicted about this liking. I found that a compelling beginning. So and we just kind of went from there. Wow. And I think that's kind of fascinating how you can find your way into these stories. And I think if you look at your film, even your action films, it's like, I, like, I don't think anyone goes to see an action film and no one comes out of it and loves it for the action. I think it's because whether or not they know it, it's because they ended up caring about the characters. You know, it, it, if you're watching an action sequence where someone's escaping on a motorcycle and you don't care about the person, you're not going to care if they escaped and the, the whole scene is kind of meaningless. And so in your work, is it hard for you to, you know, when because obviously in Midnight Run, there's so many great action sequences mm. in, in Beverly Hills Cop. Is it hard for you to balance that that character, that that emotion, along with these kind of action sequences and beats? Or well, what's that process like for you? Well, it's funny because before Beverly Hills Cop, I did a small movie that I wrote the screenplay for and directed. Uh, and, and it's called Going in Style. I mean, I did student films before that. And then, that would, and Going in Style was remade a couple of years ago. Uh, but I didn't remake it. Somebody remade it. Um, and then after that, I worked for a very long time on a, mo- on a movie I was fired off of, which was very difficult. Yeah. And then after that, I was approached to do Beverly Hills Cop, ironically, my biggest commercial success was a film that uh, I didn't originate as the only one I really wasn't wow. in on the origination of. Although once I got it, I totally redid it. Yeah. Um, but I was reluctant to get involved with it. I had to, because I only had uh, $500 at the time. <laughs> so I had, uh, <laughs> having been fired off of my previous movie, I, I, you may have heard this story about I didn't want to do it because I didn't yeah. want to do it. I didn't think I could do it. I only had $500 and uh, 
and my rent was four hundred and fifty dollars a month. <laughs> and that 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 inspired you creatively. No, you just... I still didn't want to do. It. Wow, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, I didn't have a you know, I didn't have any other source of funds, but I still turned it down. I don't know what I thought I was going to do <laughs> next time uh, I had to pay rent, but I flipped a coin eventually and i yeah. swore that whatever heads i do it tails i don't and i swore that whatever no it is i would follow and i did it was heads and i you, did the you flipped the coin yeah because i couldn't decide um yeah um but um one of the reasons i didn't want to do it one of the reasons i originally didn't want to do it is because i had no sense of action I, I thought I can't do action. I don't know what action is. It doesn't interest me. I'm not an action movie person. That, that doesn't guns and and trucks and cars and crashes and did, you know. I told the producers. I mean, what the only thing a Jew knows to to a Jew, action is the stock market. <laughs> I said no. I, I wasn't involved with the stock market, but it was it was an opportunity for a joke. So um, I didn't know anything about action, wow. uh, and I wasn't interested in it. Yeah. So my approach to action was really the same as to, to any scene. It couldn't be about the action. It had to be expressing expressing another emotion. Yeah. Not just, ooh, is it going to crash? Is it not going to crash? I mean, obviously that's going on. But my approach was almost like it was a dialogue scene, a character scene. Yeah. Um, so, so when there's a balance, it, I think it probably comes out of that, that the action is really like an expression of the characters. Obviously, this, whatever sets up the action is an expression of the character. But the actual tone of the action the music, the nature of what's happening, how it's edited, how it interfaces with the characters. It's really about uh, their character scenes. And in the case of, of those two movies, they're comedic character scenes. Yeah. Dude, that, that is fascinating. And I think the way you can kind of balance that, I think you can see that there's kind of a true line in your work, even in your films, the way that, you know, you, you can handle stakes and character and action, but knowing that action isn't even something you thought you could do. That is so fascinating to me. And I mean, so when you did Beverly Hills Cop, did you kind of feel like, okay, now action is something I can do? Or were you like, okay, maybe well, then when it was such an insane success, I got seduced. Yeah. I'm afraid. And so my next movie never occurred. I thought, okay, let's put all kinds of action in it. And I, because I came off of such a successful movie, you know, we were writing the script and, and we said, well, suppose there's a helicopter and it crashes into a mountain that blows up. On, <laughs> and, and I remember we were sitting there thinking, wait a minute, we can't put all this stuff in. <laughs> this will never. I said, no, no, let's put it all in. Let's put, we'll worry about it later. Put it all in. Don't. This is not the time to censor ourselves. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe the world will censor us. As it turns out, we pretty we did everything we wrote. That's so amazing. Um, so I'd love to take you back to to one of your earliest films, Going In Style. When you you know you did that when you were twenty something, and uh, you know I'm so I'm working on my first short film now, and I think it's something I've talked to a lot of filmmakers, but this isn't something I ever realized until now. I'm actually doing it. It's it's a scary thing to make a film to to kind of put yourself out there, and and it's something you've created when you were doing something like Going in Style, which was, you know, a kind of a commercial film. Do you remember how you felt going into something like that? Were you nervous? Were you scared? Or were you willing to? Because I mean, you were twenty. Did you feel like you had something to prove as a filmmaker? Well, I was twenty seven, uh, and I had it had followed almost a decade of student film work and yeah. the nature of doing the kind of movies I did was so hard, you know, so physically difficult yeah. and there was no money and there was no food and there was the, the days were 36 hours long, 56 hours long, 68 hours long, literally. Wow. You know, like, yeah, yeah. Brutal days, no food, no nothing, carrying equipment. So by the time it came to do a Hollywood movie where there was food on the set. <laughs> Wait, we get and to go like, toilet? There's toilet breaks? <laughs> yeah, I thought, 
I, in other words, I was, it was like I was running with, with weights on my legs and the weights were taken off. So it was wow. easy in a way. Um, That's fascinating. And, and I was dealing on that movie. I had three very, very, very respected actors. I was 27, but the lead actor was 83 because it was a movie about older guys. Yeah. And the next two guys, one was, uh, so the, the, the guy who was the lead is actually in a sound movie from, from 1929. There's a sound short with the guy and his wife. They were insanely brilliant. I don't you probably wouldn't know that. Brilliant uh, uh, comedic team, him and his wife. And they yeah. were in vaudeville, which you may or may not know about, which was an early form of like music hall variety yeah. theater. Yeah. And then they were in radio, films, television, and eventually uh, movies again. So this guy had been in the, in, in, show business for 70 plus years then the next guy was lee strasberg who was the actor teacher of all the great actors that everybody was in, terrified of he could make grown men cry so i was dealing with these people but i was 27 and i and i think they looked at me it's a time when there wasn't older directors now there are, are, are many young directors but back then it was something that was more you know a director in their late 30s was, was yeah. kind of young. So, and I was, I think they looked at me like I was a, like an infant. So really, when I, when I said something, they went, okay. You know, like <laughs> it never occurred to them to fight with me. You know, if I was 40, they'd probably argue with me, but they went, okay. Like, what are they going to do? Argue with this child? <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it was kind of oddly easy. Um, wow. Much easier than what I had done before. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, I remember the, the head of the studio came to me and I was doing this, it was a tiny little movie. I'd written this script based upon a short story I found and, uh, we were going to do this little movie and the head of the studio said to me, Stanley Kubrick, uh, can't deliver his movie for Christmas. Here's our Christmas movie. He can't deliver it in time. It was, uh, uh, Full Metal Jacket. Giant. <laughs> no, The Shining. And uh, so we need a Christmas movie. If you can get your movie ready really early, you'll be the Christmas movie. You'll get the whole push. Yeah. This is before we started shooting. But that required condensing the editing schedule ridiculously, yeah. like something I was not used to whatsoever. They said, but if you say you're going to do it, you have to do it. You can't not do it. So you think about it. If you think you can do it, tell us that you'll be the Christmas movie. But if not, don't say it and then not do it. That yeah. will not go down. So I, I said, no, no, I'll do it. <laughs> which followed my, a, a little rule I invented for myself in film school, which might serve you well. I used to say to myself when I was writing something or planning something, you know that expression, don't bite off more than you can chew? Have yes. you ever heard this? Yeah, yeah. So my expression to myself was, bite off more than you can chew and chew it the fuck anyway. <laughs> 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 so that was like, a th you know, bite off more and then just do it. So similarly, that's how we did, you know, the action scenes in Midnight Run where that was that <laughs> premise of just bite off more, but just chew it anyway. That's so terrific. So you were constantly kind of up against it all. And was it hard for you to keep your head and not be like, oh, fuck, we're behind schedule. This might go wrong. This might not work. Is that Was it hard for you as a filmmaker to stay on top of it all? Or because you had been doing student film so long, that kind of, that stress, you were used to it. You could work with it. Yeah. Well, on my first movie, you're, you mean? On yeah. The, yeah. No, uh, my first movie, uh, my, my, I was battle hard already. Yeah. So it it was relative. It was easier. Yeah. You know the uh, only thing is uh, I remember. Uh, at that time, there was only one feature quality crew in the, in New York City. They very rarely shot movies in New York City. Only Sidney Lumet, who I'm sure you know, yeah. would shoot movies in, in in New York City. So if you wanted to. Uh, a cameraman, a camera operator, a sound man, a dolly grip, a this, a that, a gaffer. There's basically only one crew's worth of top guys 
they didn't have many crews like in Hollywood. There's a million. Wow. Yeah. So we got the, that crew. And I remember one day I was walking around. We were setting up a long dolly shot. I'm walking around with my little director viewfinder. And, and the guy who worked with the crew previously came up to me and said, put that fucking thing away. This is Sidney Lumet's crew. <laughs> meaning like, don't try and act like you're Mr. You know, <laughs> director guy. Don't, don't chew you up. <laughs> I can imagine I can imagine a young Marty Bress hanging about New York with a viewfinder <laughs> oh my days that is so fascinating and so you know did you did you feel like were you looking for kind of a validation making making a commercial film did you you know because I mean when you do Beverly Hills Cop obviously it's a huge success I kind of found with my channel People say to me, oh, you, you know, you're 15. It's terrific. You're doing this. And I think once you hear it enough, it's kind of like, I like, and like, I kind of, sometimes I try and do things to kind of try and hear it more, you know? And I think that's just kind of part of something in me looking for validation, you know? And that's, that's kind mm -hmm. of, I, I normally, I wouldn't talk about that, but do you feel like with your films, were you looking for, to kind of be considered, like even at 27, were you looking to be considered? No, never. Really? Never. No, it was always about, and it's one of the reasons I didn't do that many movies, I think, is it was, for me, it was sort of about coming up with a, an emotion and coming up with an idea and then trying to figure out how to make that, how, how to make that emotion, how to convey that emotion to people and, that, 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 and then trying to really make sure that happens. And once you get into the filmmaking process with all the distractions and limitations and, uh, and uh, things working against you. How do you like not, how do you not like to let down, but continue to sort of uh, achieve the things that you want to achieve in a particular thing? So it's, for me, it was always about the thing itself, not about career status or yeah. what other people thought. I think you'll find that too. Once you start, you're going to be about the thing. Yeah. People may like, you know, one of the stories that's really important to me, one of the things that occurred to me, which would be important for you to hear that relates to this, is, uh, you know, I did my first little movie when I was 27, then I got involved with another movie and worked on it for almost two years, full time, developed all this technology that had never been developed before and really worked on it and eventually even started shooting and got fired in the shooting. And I was like 30, 31. And to get for a director on a Hollywood movie to get fired, I mean, was never done. Wow. I mean, firing a director in the middle of shooting is like firing a brain surgeon in the middle of the operation. You can't call up somebody and have them come. You know, you just can't do it. Yeah. But it didn't happen. So it was really a very high profile uh, problem. Uh, and uh, essentially, it was the end of my career because I only did one little movie before. So it was sort of like, let's let's see, is this guy going to be a director or not? And then I got fired. Not because of my work, but because I was having conflict with somebody in, in a high position. Yeah. And, um, and when I was fired, I was like, done. Uh, as I said in the variety thing, uh, I remember walking down the street, seeing somebody I know, and seeing that they saw me, they didn't know I saw them. They crossed the street to avoid having to deal with me. Because, yeah, it was terrible. So it was the very lowest part of my life. And it almost consumed me and almost finished me. And then somehow I accidentally backed into Beverly Hills Cop, which was not a comedy when I got involved with it. Uh, and uh, it was nothing like what the movie wound up being. And it wound up becoming this ridiculous success. So inside of a year, I went from being this outcast, black sheep, uh, pariah, yeah. to being the hottest thing since whatever. And I thought that's really fascinating. And, uh, and what the takeaway is when somebody says you're a bum, you're not a bum. When they say you're great, you're not great. It's like, you know what you are. It has nothing yeah. to do with how other people evaluate. So as you proceed, that's something to keep in mind. Oh my that God, that is terrific. You're, you're only, you know, as one of the great Zen masters said, 
your only possessions are your actions. It's really kind of a, takes a lifetime to really understand what, yeah. but you could have this, you could have that, but really the only thing you own is what you do in the end. Oh my God. And not even in the end, in the middle too. So as you start to find your way, um, what you're doing is the thing. Some people may like it, some people may not, some people may understand it, some people may think it's the greatest thing in the world, some people may not be able to even sit through it, whatever. You are the sole judge of what you do. And that's, uh, you know, that's the thing to keep your eye on. My God, sir, the fact that you could go through like something like that before you, you even worked on some of your biggest films and I like even come back from that. To say that's inspiring, I mean, in the least, I, I, it's, it's so terrific to, to hear you talk about that. And you, you just brought, up, and I'm so grateful you'd even bring up some of those points, which are amazing. God, that's fantastic. I'd love to ask you, what's it like for you to put your work out there? Because you know, you made a film called Midnight Run, and a young deaf kid from Ireland who lived in the countryside came across this film one day and watched it. And in 20 years, this boy had a child. And then in 15 more years, this child ends up interviewing the director. What's it like for you to make your films and put them out in the world and know that people, people in Brazil, people in America, people in Europe, people in China are watching your film? Someone's probably watching one of your movies right now. How does that feel for you as a creator? Well, it feels good because... Um, the, Again, this is not something I would talk about because they, you know, it, it, but in approaching all my movies, I hoped to, I mean, the idea that you can put a, a dream state into people's heads, yeah. both when you finish the movie and down the line, that you can put a conscious dream inside of people's minds. Yeah. That they'll they that when it's all over they'll carry a residue of is an insane privilege and responsibility in a way and I always wanted even in silly entertaining movies wanted to make sure that the residue that people were left with would somehow add to the positive yeah so even though the movie's fun and you know they, you know I wanted to. Uh, add something to people's experiences and lives and you know so when people you know come up to me and say oh i love this movie or that movie and i saw it so many times that I, what i'm really excited about is those that emotional state that i worked myself into yeah and figured out how to reverse engineer it so i could implant it in other people succeeded through time it's it's the greatest. I remember um, uh, Hal Ashby. You know Hal Ashby, the director? Yeah, yeah. A great American director. And, and apparently Warren Beatty was talking to him once towards the end of Hal Ashby's career. And I think Hal Ashby was having money problems or whatever. And Warren Beatty apparently was talking about how all these Hollywood executives had all this money or whatever the conversation was. And Hal Ashby apparently said, let them have their money. We have our movies. Yeah. Wow. Which I thought was beautiful. Wow. So, that's yeah. And I mean, I think I, I've, I've asked filmmakers about this and it's like, you make a film and then it goes out there. And then it, I think it's almost like it's not yours anymore. Like, it's almost like it goes and, and, it, and it goes in all these avenues and, and it, people see it and people watch it like i said when you made your film you put like it made its way all the way over here to dublin and it affected me it, it, like and I, you know it sounds silly and i kind of did I, I didn't know if i but like your films i truly feel have made me a better you know in, in enriched person uh, and i think that's what film is like to me film is connection and like i, I always ask kind of filmmakers what is film to you and there's i've never gotten like two of the same answers but just to me in my mind Film is about connection. It's about, you know, when you're in a room and there's 10 other people there who you don't know mm -hmm. and you're never going to know. And yet, you know, for the next two hours, you're all sharing mm -hmm. something. What what does film yeah. mean to you as a creator? 
Well, that, I mean, basically, uh, it's like this really, it's an unprecedented art form, you know, like, uh, let me show you something. Hold on one second. Yes, sir. No worries. You see this thing? Yeah, yes. This. this thing is between 250,000 and 750,000 years old. It was made by a Neanderthal. It's called a hand axe. It kind of looks like a arrowhead or something. Yeah. It's so old. I don't know if you can see the back, but like rock has grown on it. Yeah. Like rock has grown on this chipped stone. So this object was made by something that wasn't even what we are. We're a homo sapiens. It wasn't even a homo sapien. And it still is here. And I'm told and we're both engaged with it. And the creature, person, soul, entity that made this thing is long evaporated. Um, so that is amazing. So, that, so we're talking wow. about uh, what does it mean to me? Um, you know, the idea that you can take something that's inside of your head yeah. and, and put it out there, uh, not for eternity, but for a while, and it could find its way into people that like it, don't like it, or really appreciate it, profit by it, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty, it's a pretty great art form. It's beautiful, isn't it? Wow, hearing you talk about it and just that that rock. Yes, that's what I mean. Someone, me and you, will never meet this person. We'll never find them. They'll never it may know. Not even have been a person. What one of the things that's really interesting about these, and I have a number of them, is that um, what we are, Homo sapiens, that little branch of the evolutionary tree, I think is only I don't know, two hundred fifty thousand years old, two hundred fifty thousand years, something like that. There are different human-like creatures that existed that had intelligence and creativity. And I've seen hand axes like this that were 750,000 years old that were beautiful in a way they didn't have to be if they were just a tool. Some creature, you know, a lot of them are crude, but some of them are stunning. And whatever the creature was, that human-like creature that made it and was taught by its parents, yeah. presumably, made it extra beautiful. Like, not just sharp so it could cut mastodon meat, but like, wanted to make it extra beautiful. Yeah. Why? Why would somebody want to make something spend all that work to make something extra beautiful 750,000 years ago. Well, it's kind of like the same thing. Like what's that desire to just make something, you know. Better. Yeah, that's so, and yeah. yeah. And I think it's, everything goes on its course. That hand X was created, you know, and it went on such, it, it's probably been, it, it started in some place in the world, it was crafted in some place in the world ended up in Martin Brest's house because Martin Brest went through a series of events that led him to finding this. And that same hand X ended up being involved in an interview with me. And now for the rest of my life, I'll remember that forever. And it just, it gets trippy, doesn't it? I feel like I'm on cocaine or so. Like, it just keeps going and gone. But it's, I think it is, about, <laughs> <laughs> it is like everything is. I think that's what it's about, connection. It, we're filming in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think we were talking about something before we got off on that. But no, I mean, I think when you look at kind of film as an art form, did you always know you wanted to do it since you were a kid, since you were watching those Chaplin kind of film? Did you no, know? No, I didn't know. Wow. I, I, when I was 12, 13, 14, 15, well, 12, 13, 14, I was just receiving the thrill and the impact. Uh, and I didn't know what that was, but it really had an impact on me. I wasn't a cinemaphile. I didn't like to go see a lot of movies. Movies per se didn't interest me. Certain movies really interested me. Certain movies pierced my heart. But movies as a thing were not that interesting to me. I don't know a, a lot about the broad history of cinema. There's a certain kind of band of, of cinema that I'm 
fanatically interested in historically. Uh, but my interest is kind of like a narrow interest. I'm like, you know, like when you hear Scorsese or Tarantino talk, they're just, yeah, it's a, it's amazing what they know. That, that, for better or worse, has never been the thing that I've responded to. My interest has been very narrow and and, and personal and small, sort of. Wow. And I think maybe that's where I think your connection with character comes from, because character is obviously, is character the most important thing for you while crafting a film? Is it always character? Yeah. Yeah. I, not only in, in making a film, but in watching a film. Like when I, I can't watch a film where I can see that the actors aren't tapped into something that's going to show me something about human behavior I, I've never seen before. It doesn't have to be a great performance or anything, but sometimes you see people just doing the scene. They're telling mm -hmm. the story, which has its place. But sometimes you see somebody, even if they're just walking down the street quietly in a scene, you can just see, like, that they have a thing going on that's compelling you yeah. in some way. So when I see when I see the lack of that, I just can't pay attention. I just uh, and that's the thing that really uh, hooks me. That's so fascinating because in Scent of a Woman, there's a scene where you know Chris O'Donnell, uh, you know Charles, he's he, he's shy when he's introduced to Frank, and he kind of rubs his hand across the table you know, not really mm -hmm. knowing what to do. And I, like, I remember seeing that and like, that was shyness visually. That was something that told us about human behavior that I connected with in that mm -hmm. moment. So, I mean, directing those performances, what are those conversations like with the actor trying to find out something about human behavior? Uh, is that something that, you know, you struggle with trying to, is that an, or is that an aspect of filmmaking that actually kind of comes easy to you? No, it's because uh, it's not just filmmaking. It's it's understanding acting, yeah, uh, and it's which is an ununderstandable, endless thing. And every actor is completely different because unlike playing piano or or something like that, it's a strange, weird art form that uh, yeah. every actor figures out on their own. Even though they're great acting teachers and schools of acting, it's really ultimate ultimately up to an actor to figure out how to do it and plus it, it's why are they doing it what are they trying to do there are all kinds of actors that have different goals different ideals different levels of what they consider acceptable uh, uh, different uh, targets uh, all they're all different so one of the things that interests me is getting involved with people that take that pursuit seriously and they do it in all different ways and trying to figure out how to work in collaboration with them to bring out yeah. cool things. Wow. That to me is the thing. Yeah. And I think that's kind of, you know, clear in your work. Like even when you're working with Robert De Niro and you can kind of bring, bring out, you know, a side to him that, that hasn't really, I don't think been seen in film before or even with Eddie Murphy, who I know you talked about in the article. Like, isn't it true the studios could not imagine Eddie Murphy in Beverly Hills Cop? Yeah, uh, the, the, only because at that time, I don't know that an African-American actor, uh, maybe Sidney Poitier, had a, a lead in a hit movie. I don't know that it had happened. Wow. So, and, and Eddie had always been the second guy in uh, Coming to America. Coming, I forgot the movies he did before that movie, Trading Places. Yeah. Uh, Coming to America may have been after I'm not. No, I think it was before. I don't remember. And uh, 48 Hours. The idea of him being the guy yeah. was, for, was for the studio elite. Although he, Eddie was so talented and so charismatic that anybody in the history of cinema could do it. But for me, I didn't even think of any sort of racial component. To me, that was like not even... Yeah. He was just so extraordinary i mean the idea of having him be the lead of, of that story uh i knew would give me a chance to really make that story take off because he was in he was truly an outsider to the world of beverly hills yeah in a way that the other actors were thinking about you know weren't 
Yeah. And I think that that's so fascinating just to hear you talk about that and the way you can delve into character and, and just hearing your creation and the way you can kind of jump into these words. Like I said, you know, when you came into it, it wasn't like I, I know they wanted like Stallone and you can kind of and like you came in and you put your take on it and you kind of created these words after making Beverly Hills Cop, which was kind of such a big success. What do you remember what that felt like for you making a film that connected with so many people across the world? It's funny. Uh, well, I really, you know, especially after getting fired off of my previous movie, it was, it was a pleasant relief, as you can imagine. But, you know, when we screened the movie for the first time, people that were at that screening said they never saw a screening ever in their life. Like that. people were actually standing on their chairs, screaming and talking to the characters and cheering. It was like nuts. It was like it was like a rock concert. It was crazy. Gosh. And when I was watching it, the first this first time we screened it for an audience, I thought, okay, yeah, right. Like I I thought that, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted there. It's happening. Good. Let's see if the next thing's good. Like it just seemed right. Like that was the goal. Yeah. Uh, and that it achieved the goal seemed it was great you know the fact that it was insanely commercially successful was just really really nice and uh especially at that point in my life after being ground into the dirt uh, it was, and you came back yeah. from I, that's that's so brilliant and I then... could have very easily not have. i mean the, the fact that i was i mean the movie that i got fired off of i could have made a spectacular movie that, but I, you know i was having problems with uh people in charge um, on Beverly Hills Cop. I was fortunate enough to have two brilliant producers who whose skill and gift, amongst other things, was bringing out the best in their director rather than trying to ex exert their ego over a director, which yeah. was the problem I had on the prior movie that resulted in conflict and my getting fired. You know, sometimes people, you know, everybody's allowed to have opinions and I'll take an opinion from anybody that has a good opinion and, and has talent. But when somebody's just in their position because of some business appointment ship, you know, and they're trying to exert a creative opinion that stinks, I, that, I couldn't let that go. So I, it was a conflict that kept me from doing my best work and, and got me fired. But then like a few months later, I was allowed, I was encouraged to do my best work and, know, without constraint. And I think it's that collaboration, which brings out the best in everyone involved, you know, when yeah, you, because yeah. I mean, that's what film is, you know, I think film, film, like people look at it and say, oh, the director made a perfect film, but it's like, yeah, well, so did, you know, even the PAs and production assistants and so did the people yeah. who painted the background. And the writer and the editor. I mean, yeah. editors never get enough credit because nobody sees what they do. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've had, it's interesting. I, I'm a, I've seen people talk about my movies. I mean, the way I approach my movies, what I'm doing is I'm not designing what you're looking at. Yeah. I'm designing what you're feeling. That's where my total involvement is. What do you feel here? What do you feel there? What's the you know the the surging catharsis that you feel here? And then it's intersected with this other emotion, a laugh or whatever. Like I'm this that's where my work is, not in what you see, not in shots and things. And you know, you can't see what I'm doing. You can only feel what I'm doing. So if you see a movie of mine and you enjoy it, or something, that's what I was designing, not how it looks. Obviously, you use how it looks. You, you have to be involved with how it looks. But the real work is in the architecture of your emotional involvement. To the extent where I've seen people talk about my films online, you know, YouTube and podcasts and things like that, which I'm embarrassed to uh, admit that I've tuned into on occasion. And they'll talk about a movie of mine and they'll love every drop of it. I heard one episode of a podcast, that it was a visual one too, where there was a very important Pulitzer Prize winning critic on it. And they were talking about one of, they were talking about Beverly Hills Cop. 
Yeah, yeah. And they were all sitting around talking like, oh, it's magnificent. This guy, that guy, this line, that line, that piece of music. Blah, 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 blah. And they were talked about it for like an hour. And then somebody said, oh, and, oh, and, and Martin Brest directed it. And this critic said, oh, the less we talk about him, the better. After talking about how he loved every micro bit of this yeah. movie. And then somebody said to him, well, you know, he, he, he made Midnight Run. And the guy kind of went, oh, well, well, that's a perfect movie. So I think of like, but yet they didn't understand that the person, that what they were experiencing yeah. was the goal and the work of somebody. They kind of view that as a, a part. So people don't often know who's what they're feeling. Editors, their work, it, it, there's no way to appreciate an editor's work unless you've been in the editing room the whole time. Like yeah. an award for editing, it, there's no way anybody could know who really did more of an accomplishment in that because you can't see it. You can only feel it. Yeah. And you don't know what they have to work with. Uh, and also writers, everybody, nobody knows who, who's really responsible for what they're feeling. Yeah, and it's like I got to interview Eddie Hamilton, who edits Mission Impossible and the, all the recent Mission Impossible films. And he was saying, you know, it's a manipulation, you know, when you make a film, whether or not you know it, you're kind of, you know, and he's not in a harsh way, but you, the audience wants to be manipulated. That's why you buy a ticket. You want this film to have an emotional effect on you. And you want to believe it. You 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 are kind of trying to manipulate the yeah. audience in in a, in a beautiful way, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to think of it exactly in that way, and then I realized, you know, manipulation is is a definitely a, a tool of filmmaking. But it, the word has an ugly uh, connotation. So yeah, is yeah. that deserved or not? Well, in a way, it is deserved because you can be manipulated into an emotion or you can actually genuinely have that emotion. So you can get the, the emotion with two different approaches. Yeah. Uh, so, and various combinations of them. So, you know, there's, it, it's, it's an infinite, there's an infinite set of uh, goals and challenges. Wow. Yeah. And, I, and I, so also I'd love to ask you, coming off Beverly Hill Cops, you know, did you feel a freedom going into Midnight Run? Because you were just made such a successful yes. <laughs> big time. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can see it in your oh. eyes. Your eyes lit yeah. up when I said was there free. <laughs> Although, other than the movie I got fired off of, I somehow enjoyed Kubrickian freedom from my whole I don't know why. Even on my first movie going and stuff, nobody said anything to me about anything about casting, music, editing. I just wrote it. They said, great, let's make it. Who do you want in it? I said, these guys, okay, let's do, you know. Nobody said anything. I thought, well, that's how it is. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, it's like if, 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 if that's just how it was in film school. I thought that's how it is. But it's not how it is a lot. But it was that way for me, other than getting fired and other than my last debacle. Uh, I, I was allowed to do whatever I wanted, not in a crazy way, but I just, you know, I enjoyed a freedom that I'm very grateful for. And uh, and then in Midnight was, Run, you took it to the extreme. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. terrible. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, so what was it like for you getting to do something like Midnight Run? Obviously, I mean, did you see something in, a, in, in an actor like De Niro that, you know, kind of no one else had seen before because we hadn't seen him in a role like that. No, no. Uh, well, you know, we got the screenplay ready. And then um, it was time to cast it. And, you know, my previous movie, had, Beverly Hills Cop, was sort of like a you know, action comedy. So this was kind of like an action comedy. Yeah. Uh, and, you know... When we started thinking about the names, like who could anchor it in a really interesting way? And my agent at the time, a guy by the name of Jack Rapke, said, how about De Niro? Which was like the stupidest, crazy idea ever. Like De Niro. He's like the most 
heavy, dramatic act. The greatest, like a god to me. He was a god to really? me. Oh, God. Was, was okay, this go. after Rage and Bull, Taxi Drive? Oh, yeah. Yes, wow. it was after Godfather 2. It was after Rage and Bull. It was after Mean Streets. It was after, I mean, he was a god. I mean, in a way, the actors were more gods to me than directors. Like he, Pacino, these were gods. But De Niro particularly was very mysterious. He was a very mysterious, almost Brando-esque figure. And uh, I thought if I could work with Robert De Niro, me, it, it's not the kind of guy I would think of for this role, <laughs> but if I could do it, I'll just do it. And then I'll figure the rest out. <laughs> That's a good way so, to approach making a film. If you can get the Nero. It's weird. I'm, I mean, that could be a bad way to approach a film. It just so happens. I mean, you know, he's obviously one of the greatest actors who's ever lived. Yeah. You know. So, uh, so yeah, that was I just think... sort of like, I want to work with Robert De Niro. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. Let's... Think, in your opinion, was the heart of that film, the relationship between De Niro and Groden, was it that were these was it that hair and that relationship and that dynamic that was kind of most fascinating for you as a filmmaker? Yeah. Wow, that, most... was the whole, that was the whole thing really. The nature of their scenes. You know, it goes back to that thing I was telling you about earlier, the um that TV show The Honeymooners. Yeah. Which was basically two guys. You know. And the model for those guys was Laurel and Hardy. Wow. Uh, who I also really love. Sort of a big, blustery, angry guy and a sort of kind of holy fool guy. It was the same model, the honeymooners. And I just always loved that that structure of two people. Like it seemed like if you can reduce a story to two people, it just that would be really cool. So uh, that that model of exploring two people and uh, really paying a lot of attention again back from the silent movies, the silent comedies that I like, aside from Chaplin, Buster Keith, but Laurel and Hardy, their silent movies and their sound movies, as well as uh, the Honeymooners. The comedy came out of part of the comedy came out of what they thought of each other yeah. at any given moment. Yeah, like yeah. somebody says something stupid and the other guy looks at them. So the other guy evaluating the stupid comment becomes the humor. And then the other, you know, so the, the again, the architecture, the moment by moment architecture of how the people regard each other. When you sculpt it very finely, it's really uh, meticulously edit the scenes uh, so that the timing of their evaluation of each other becomes, in a way, the plot, even though people don't perceive that necessarily. Yeah, that becomes what's compelling. People think it's chemistry or whatever they, but it's really that how the specificity with which they regard each other over the course of the movie, over the course of each scene, from the beginning of each scene to the end of each scene, is the thread in life. Yeah, and I think... And the humour, and the humour. Yeah, there's a scene of the two of them in the train, and I feel like that those kind of couple of minutes are like, they're some of the most beautiful kind of character, char char you know, storytelling involving characters I've ever seen, you know, the way they both start laughing. I think you can see their relationship there within those few scenes. Are you, when you're on set, are you willing to, are you a perfectionist or are you willing to kind of Bruce Lee kind of, you know, make it's like water or what are you like as a filmmaker? Are you, are you meticulous? Well, those are, not, those are not mutually exclusive characteristics. On uh, my very first movie, Going in Style, I, I was so, you know, it was the first time I was making a professional movie yeah. in, the, in the last of the old days of Hollywood, where it was, you know, I had to do a really professional job. So I, I, I kept such a tight control on it that it was lifeless in a way, it was airless. And there was only a scene that we shot, a very last scene that we shot, it was a, uh, a crap game, a dice game in Las Vegas, where I discovered a whole different way of working, which I integrated into Beverly Hills Cop and Midnight Run, which is a 
like water kind of way. It's a take to take improvisational, uh, you know, based on a very, 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 very meticulously worked out script, which we filmed. But then within the, the constrictors of that meticulousness, we knew if we hit this kind of moment here, that would work. If only we could get that other kind of moment. And, yeah, and knowing the requirements of the story and of each scene and of each part of each scene allowed for an on the set flexibility to incorporate accidents, improvisations, mm-hmm. uh, allow for experiments, even if they go awry, that you then can meticulously refine editorially, make it look like it was all planned out somehow. That's that's so fascinating. Uh, I'm so sorry for taking up so much of your time. My last couple that's of times, okay. I swear. Uh, I, I, I'd love to ask you, what's it been like for you to see the work you've had, the, the effect you've had on other filmmakers? I know Paul Thomas Anderson, who was one of my favorite filmmakers of all time as well. I mean, Magnolia. And then I, I, I don't yeah. know if it's Christopher McQuarrie, who directs Mission Impossible. He directed the most recent Mission Impossible. And like, he's one of my favorite filmmakers. He wrote Usual Suspects. He has a letterbox where he talks about the films that inspire him. And Midnight Run is on it. And he's a big fan of your work. What's cool. it been- yeah. So what's it been like for you to see the effect you've had on filmmakers and people in the in the film industry as well as the, is it different for you, the effect you've had on filmmakers as opposed to the general audience or? It's hard to tell. I mean, I mean, I don't know the extent of it per se, but the nature of anything, painting, filmmaking, writing, anything, acting is that people like is what I was telling you, I saw things that moved me. Yeah. And then that made me want to get involved involved with that sphere. And, you know, like Midnight Run, for instance, there's a film. When I saw Midnight Run in Los Angeles a couple of years ago, the first time I saw it on a big screen with an audience since it came out. And uh, Paul Thomas Anderson was going to interview me after the movie. And I sat in the theater and I watched it. And I was sort of amazed, frankly. I thought, man, this movie, this movie is, t- is really brilliantly constructed. And then I realized I was experiencing, because I've been so removed from it, I was experiencing the thing that I was intending for it to do and worked endlessly to construct, which was basically a replication of an experience I had when I was 12 when my mother took me to see a film called It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And I don't know if you've ever seen it. It was a film done in 62 or something, 63, something like that. And it was an epic comedy, epic. Every comedic actor in the United States was in it. I mean, the cast list was insane. And it was done at a very high budget in a very wide format, I don't know what they called it, CinemaScope at the time, some crazy ass thing. And it was in such a large format, be the equivalent of IMAX today. But back then, very few places could show it. Like they had to build special arrangements in various cities to show it. I, I believe it was shown on three, three projectors working at the same time, like, you know, that they had to match up. It was just, and it was in these giant theaters and they had one theater they showed it in New York and one in LA, I think. And uh, then they showed the regular dopey version all over the country. But this epic version, you had to buy a seat for it in advance, which was never done back in the day. And it was a big deal. And my mother took me down on the subway from the Bronx to Manhattan to see. And I never went to a movie with my mother. I and mean, it was like a weird event. Never went to the theater. Never went to anything. It was the first, first major cultural event. And this movie blew me away. It was just extraordinary. And what the movie is, they've since restored it. So if you ever could see it on a, any kind of movie screen, you yeah. have the chance. It's a epically told story of 15, 20, I don't know how many characters. They start gathering characters in pursuit of a goal. And there's all these different, like, these guys are after this thing, and those guys are after this thing. And they... They meet and intersect, and it's a beautifully constructed thing. And the 
the power of, of watching these parallel actions, these parallel storylines comedically intertwine and build this synergistic momentum was thrilling. Yeah. And when I started working on Midnight Run, when we were working on the script, I wanted to do that. That was my goal. And Midnight Run is a is a is a dwarf compared to uh, Mad Mad World, which is e epic. But when I was sitting in the theater watching it in in um, Los Angeles, I thought, "Oh my God, I I did actually do it. I created that experience that I felt when I was a child, and because it was implanted in me when I was a child, it took yeah. you know years and years and years of." developing skills and developing professional credibility to be able to do it. But I wound up doing it. So to answer your question, this isn't just a rant, that you see things that move you and they go into your reservoir. Yeah. And they, that does two things. It makes you want to do something. And then eventually when you get a chance to do it, you can't help but, but, it's, but having what inspired you come out in some various form. So every filmmaker, every painter, every actor, every musician, every songwriter has that reservoir of things that then after they accumulate their skill set, get filtered through them and come out as something else. And then that influences other people and goes on and on. That's terrific. And I mean, hearing you talk about that film, I'm reminded of Magnolia by Paul Thomas Anderson. I don't know if you ever yeah. seen it. That's a film. Yeah, yeah. The first time, yeah, the first time I saw that, uh, you know, I was like, by the end of it, I couldn't believe it because, you know, it was the idea of all these different characters who had, you know, different lives. And, you know, th there's a fantastic line at the end, which is, um, you know, forgiveness. What can we forgive? And then you see all these characters and they're and they're all connected in some way. And then the mm -hmm. frogs start falling from the sky. And I remember thinking, what's going on? And yeah, it's still it's still stayed in my brain. And now it's one of my favorite films ever made. And one day I'm going to get Paul Thomas Anderson on. and I'm just going to ask him everything about Magnolia. But it is tell true. Tell him you had me on. Write him an email and tell him you had me on. That's what I'm going to say. I'm gonna say tell, tell him I recommended you contact him. <laughs> I'm gonna tell Seriously. Mark. I absolutely, I absolutely will. So if I can find a way, I will. I'll track him down and I'll find his email somewhere and I'll say, "Me and Martin Breast, we're best mates. Me and Martin Breast, go way back." Oh God, yeah. But no, it, tell it, him. It, tell him literally. Tell him I said he's got to do it. Oh my God, I'm absolutely gonna take you. Off. If anyone out there has Paul Thomas Anderson's email, just comment it down below into the abyss, and we'll get that going. Oh God, but uh, no, I'd love to ask you. Coming off something like Midnight Run, you, you went on to Scent of a Woman, which is like, it was like, it wasn't necessarily a comedy film. What Did you just want to do something different? Well, oddly enough, that's probably closer to, to what I would have started out doing, probably. I mean, my first movie was not, in other words, the action comedy thing isn't how I, that I got sidetracked, that and a certain side of me came out doing that. I mean, the when I was doing Beverly Hills Cop, I, it was sort of like this police fish out of water thing, and it was inherently boring to me. So I thought, how am I going to liven this up to thrill me? So I started putting people in the movie that were sort of against the genre yeah. to like entertain myself, you know. And that's what you know, all these great character actors, which is a weird term. They're just actors, um, you know, kind of created that whole thing but Scent of a Woman really was sort of um, probably more me than the other movies more stylistically yeah. Not, yeah I don't know if it's more but yeah and I think you know even in Meet Joe Black as well which is another film do you feel like Meet Joe Black is something that's more stylistically you yeah yeah, it's the slow version. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's like uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. Someone asked him if you could go back and redo Magnolia, what would you do? And he said, "Smoke a blunt and cut fifteen minutes off it." And it's like you know, but I still think something like I, I like I love Meet Joe Black. I think it's a terrific film. Thank you, Magnolia. Just as a, I remember when I said, I don't know if you've ever seen it on a big screen. My God, I would kill. It's it was really designed for big screen. It was shot in. In, in Panavision and it, it's it's thunderously 
potent on a big screen. But I remember when I went to see it for the first time, when the frog started, I literally felt I was lifting off my seat. I was like, yeah. I was so thrilled. I was, it was like an ecstatic religious experience. I felt like I was rising off. The, I was so, I was so uh, elated and ecstatified. Yeah. That. It yeah. Was, you've just summed that up exactly how I felt. I couldn't articulate. Yeah. That's exactly how I felt. And it's, and I think it's about all these characters who, you know, they all have their own stories and yet there is that connection. There is that thorough line of human behavior in all of them. They are all that similar in some way. But that uh, it's to see Magnolia in a cinema, God, that that I, I can't can't even imagine what that'd be like. But no, that's amazing. Like the, like Paul Thomas Anderson who made that was obviously, of course, hugely inspired by your work as well. Which I mean, uh, it's... I don't. I wouldn't say that. I think he liked some of the movies I made. I wouldn't say he was inspired by my work. That would be. Sen was it wasn't it Scent of a Woman that made him cast a uh, Philip Seymour? Well, well, it didn't make him. Ca I think that's where he first saw. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that was amazing. And what was it like working with, you know, Phil on, oh, sorry, Mr. Hoffman on a film like Scent of a Woman? What was that like for you? Well, you know, we were, we were conducting auditions for um, the, the, not, you know, the Chris O'Donnell character was cast or was in the process of being cast. And we needed this other group of boys. There was one lead boy who was the boy that was going to be in the disciplinary committee hearing at the end of the movie and his crew of buddies and so philip came in as one of the buddies because he didn't really seem like the kind of guy that was the lead guy i pictured a much more handsome tennessee looking you yeah. know kind of guy uh but he was so outrageously brilliant he was just doing little improvs as one of the tertiary characters. And I thought, it's like the De Niro thing. I got it. That guy has to be the lead guy. He's just insane. He was working in a delicatessen at the time. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, he was just so insane that uh, I, put, I gave him the lead part. Even though he wasn't what I would have imagined. Yeah. He was much more... A frumpy looking than I would imagine that guy, but that doesn't. I mean, that guy, you know, to think of a look for in casting is is really a mistaken approach. Yeah. And you really got to go for a, a certain kind of essence in somebody. And he gave an absolutely terrific performance in that film. Stunning. I mean, Stunning. can you watch your old films and your old work, or is it is it still is it because some filmmakers are like. 400 times in the edit once at the premiere and never again unless it, maybe they're on their deathbed and it comes across one of the channels so it might catch 20 minutes of it before turning it over very rarely very 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 rarely yeah i mean when you're finished with a movie you go and never want to see it for decades yeah it's too it's so ptsd wow. yeah <laughs> well, t you know, not that my opinion means anything, but I can certainly tell you your films still hold up. Uh, Mr. Brest, my last and final question I'd love to ask you. What advice would you have for anyone looking to become a filmmaker? Well, I don't know, but let me, let me put this, let me make this very specific to you. Because I intuit as I'm sure anybody watching this with a with a, a sense of human behavior would intuit, that you're a very, very specially gifted young man and you have uh, you have something uh, that is invaluable, which, which is you have a sincere passion and focus. And that is really a gift because that is in a way the most important thing. And that will carry you towards your goals. And if your goals are being a filmmaker, which I see they are, even though you're manifesting it as an interviewer now, uh, because that's your way in to sort of learn more and, and, and start to figure out how to start your path. I think that uh, you, the path you have ahead of you is glorious i would bet everything i got on it and so my advice to you is 
uh, just keep focusing on what you feel is important, you personally. You know, you can always listen to other people and their opinions, but uh, the best way to listen to other people's opinions is not to follow them, but to feel that they're resonant with you. Sometimes somebody says something and you say, oh, that feels right. Sometimes they say, you go, oh, that feels wrong. So it, the, having people suggest things to you as you go along needs to go through the filter of you. And it's clear to me that you're gifted with the, all the equipment you need to go as far as you wish in the, whatever direction you wish, be it becoming a, uh, a director or becoming a, uh, an eye surgeon or whatever you want to do. Uh, I know as sure as I know anything that you, Daniel, can do it. God, uh, Mr. So Rice. also, just to give you a little more. So my advice would be start doing it. Don't be afraid of mistakes. Don't be afraid of getting depressed because you aimed at something and it didn't turn out the way you wanted or you don't feel like you're capable of doing it or it's not what you hope to do. Don't worry about that. All the mistakes, all the disappointments are fuel for your next set of decisions. And that's how you build a skill set and take in a lot of stuff. Obviously, you're well-versed in film, uh, but listen to music, look at paintings, read literature, talk to interesting people, blah, blah, blah. You know, just take everything in wherever you can get it and just keep going and little by little by little by little before you know it. There you go. I'm Mr. Breast, sir. I've I've been very fortunate and I've gotten to interview a lot of people that, you know, are personal heroes of mine. But I say this from the bottom of my heart, getting to interview you is something that I swear to God, I'll spend the rest of my life earning it. Uh, you know, um, I messaged you and you showed me such a kindness. And I, you know, I've been thinking about, and I like, I think about this all the time. We are the supremely lucky ones. That's a line from the email you sent me. And I'm like, I'm nobody. And this is, you could have interviewed, done an interview with anyone, anywhere. And the fact that you take the time to chat, sorry, the fact that you take the time to chat with me, it really means a lot, sir. So I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. It's such a, it's such a pleasure. And I just love, I'd love to ask you, uh, you know, why did you reply to my email? Just, you know, when I messaged you then. Because I sensed something that I identified. And then I saw one of the interviews, I went online, and I saw one of the interviews, and I, what I saw uh, reinforced my intuition, which is, how old are you now? Uh, I, I just turned 16 yesterday. Yesterday was my birthday. 16. I, I have ice cubes older than you. Uh, uh, I sensed something uh, that I could identify in, you know, having started out as a kid being interested in this, having gone to film school, having seen a million kids that wanted to do this or wanted to do that, wanted to be actors or directors or painters or musicians, and seeing how that unfolds over time, uh, I have a extra developed sense for identifying uh, kids of which I practically never encounter any that have the thing that will allow them to continue on. And I sensed that in your email. I just sensed it. And when I saw your interview thing, I, I it was confirmed. Speaking to you obviously confirms it. And, you know, when 15 years from now, people are going to go back and look at your kid interviews and say, oh, my God, look at Daniel C. doing these interviews. He looks like a little kid. That's hilarious. Look at him with his microphone and the... You know, I could just see that whole thing playing out. I could, I could see where a moment like this will sit on the spectrum of time, uh, which is one of the benefits one gets of having seen it over decades and decades. So if that answers your question, I just saw a very specific set of qualities. Thank you, sir. I cannot thank you enough, really. Just you've shown me nothing but kindness, and you know I do not like I sound like a broken clock, but really you are one of my heroes, and your work has touched me more than words can articulate. And I, you know, I, I'm sorry, you know, for, you know, but it just 
I wish I could articulate and I swear to God I would spend the rest of my life earning the kindness and I truly hope one day I am half the man and half the filmmaker you are. And I just, I want you, I want to thank you and I want you to know that if I could articulate how your films have affected me and if I could give you, if I, I could, think you have. Do you reckon? I that, did I get that true? If I could give you 5% of how your films have made me feel, I'd be a happy man. Martin, before we finish up, is there anything you can promote or talk about anything you want? Can people go follow you on social media or anything like that? No, I don't do that. No, there's nothing to follow. That's that's terrific. But sir, thank you truly from the bottom of my heart. Everyone. This thank is you. My thank interview. you. Thank you, sir. I'll talk to you a little bit off air. Before we finish up, you can go follow me over on Instagram, Daniel Fee 33 And as always, if you have the means, please make sure to donate to the National Deaf Children Society. And I've wanted to interview you for so long, and I can't believe I finally got the chance to do it. You're an absolute legend and I'll forever be grateful to you. So thank you so much, Mr. Breast. And thank you all so much for watching. Thank you, sir.